أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يقه قولي ربنا زدنا علما اللهم فقهنا في الدين إلهي أمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I welcome all of you to our Ramadan series 2024 and Alhamdulillah today is our grand finale and Alhamdulillah so good to see everyone mashallah um, Alhamdulillah we're all gathered here in this blessed masjid Alhamdulillah once again to do a khatma of Quran so um, let's begin our session today so subhanAllah uh, yesterday we covered part of surah um, a part of Juz 30. So we went through some of the surahs starting from Surat Naba all the way till Ghashia. So inshallah, today we are going to begin from Surat Fajr all the way till Surat Nas. And of course, the Jews has, subhanAllah, 2,308 words. So imagine for every letter that we recite, every letter that we go through, we ponder, we contemplate, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to bless us with 10 hasanat. So multiply that 70 times more because there is a barakah, especially in the month of Ramadan. So we're talking about a chunk of reward. Alhamdulillah. So all we need to do is to do it with sincerity, to do it with the expectation to attain the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Be hopeful and inshallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward us and guide us. So let's begin. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. So Surah Fajr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts off the surah with Wal Fajr, Walayalin Ashr. So basically, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this surah takes an oath by the 10 blessed days of Dhul Hijjah. And to highlight the importance of it, subhanAllah, Ramadan is something that is um very important in our hearts. Every one of us are acquainted with the importance of Ramadan. We all prepare for Ramadan. We get together for Taraweeh in Ramadan. So Alhamdulillah, because all of us is doing it, public ibadah is something very easy. So we're all able to accomplish it. But when it comes to the 10 days of um, Dhul Hijjah, SubhanAllah, that is something which is the secret ibadah. And in terms of a holistic worldview, both ibadat are required to do public ibadah because it gives us feelings of sisterhood, being together in the masjid. It strengthens our iman, so that's important. So that's the month of Ramadan that we're witnessing right now. And then on the other hand, the 10 days of Dhul Hijjah is private ibadah because that is our ibadah at our home in which the Prophet wasallam recommended to us to fast during the nine days of Dhul Hijjah. If not, then we can do just the ninth of Dhul Hijjah because it grants us forgiveness of sins. So while we're fasting, we should do a lot of good deeds because the Prophet wasallam said that these are the best of days. So whatever we do is going to be highly rewarded. So because there are people around us who are not doing the 10 days of Dhul Hijjah as much as Ramadan, people even amongst our own family members may not be fasting with us. It's a little difficult and hard, overwhelming on us to actually appreciate Dhul Hijjah just as we do Ramadan. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this surah takes an oath of this time the 10 days of Dhul Hijjah. And of course, it carries the story of Ad and Samud. Lots of lessons to learn for it. But the highlight of the surah that I want to focus is the last passage where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about nafsul mutma'inna. And subhanAllah, as we were going through our Quran journey, we studied the fact that there are three types of nafs. There is nafsul ammara besu, which always entices us to commit evil. And then there is nafsul lawama, which is the self-reproaching nafs. And it's always blaming us. Anytime we mess up, it blames us. Anytime we do wrong, it blames us. Anytime we lack the, you know, seizing the opportunity of khayr, it blames us. So it's basically like the moral compass that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has inbuilt in us, within us. So subhanAllah, that is something that takes us from nafsul amara basu all the way to nafsul mutma'inna. So this is the last 
nafs that are going that is going to be discussed in the Quran. What it, what does it literally mean? It means the nafs which is in a state of itminan, which is in a state of tranquility. So imagine yourself that you have witnessed multiple Ramadans. You have done a lot of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have tried your best to take care of your masajids, you know, subhanAllah, donate for your masajids, teach your children the basics of Islam, tried your best to do as much as you can to help humanity, serve the creation of Allah. And you're doing all this, and then all of a sudden, death comes knocking at your door. Imagine the state of your happiness, the state of your heart, when you are given glad tidings by the angels who tell you, Ya ayyatuha nafsul mutma'inna, irji'i ila rabbiki radiyatan mardiyah, fadkhuli fi ibadi, wadkhuli jannati. Just imagine that the angels whom you have never seen, whom you have never witnessed in your lifetime, come to you, and you're able to see them. And they give you the glad tidings as you meet them for the first time and welcome you. They give you the bashara that you're gonna enter Jannah with the rida of Allah, with the pleasure of Allah. And that is the ultimate goal for each one of us. That as we are transitioning from one phase to another, as we are going through the journey of life, our ultimate success to be the valedictorians on the day of Piyama is to receive this glad hiding from the angels. If we're able to get it, Alhamdulillah, it is true success. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us about this. And when we look at the Salaf al Salihin, subhanAllah, we come to know that a believer always gets intuition of death before even they die. And this is part of that Bashara package, by the way, subhanAllah. So it comes about Fadala ibn Dinar, rahimahullah, one of the scholars in the Salaf al-Salihin, that as soon as, subhanAllah, he was busy with his daily chores, whatever, he began to see something. And he immediately recognized that these are the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he said to them, welcome to the angels of my Lord. There is no strength nor power except by Allah. I smell the sweetest fragrance that I have never come across. And that's when his gaze stopped and he passed away. Also, we come to know about Uthman radiallahu anh, the third khalifa of Islam, that when he was about to die, one day before, he sees a dream. And in the dream, he sees Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam giving him the intuition that, Ya Uthman, tomorrow you shall break your fast with us. And Uthman radiallahu anh knew for sure that tomorrow is the day of my death. And these glad tidings, these dreams that are given to the believers as Bashara, they are actually khair for us. Now, we may be thinking I'm not as righteous as Usman. I'm not righteous as, um, you know, the Salaf al-Salihin. So what if I don't get this Bashara? The scholars say if a person is diagnosed with a chronic illness and a person is given chance to connect to Allah, to do tawbah, to increase his salawat, to increase his dhikr in the last days, to ask forgiveness from all his loved ones and others. This is a bashara for him that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to meet him in a state of purity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to welcome him in a state of his rida. So even that is a glad tiding. So many a times when people are diagnosed with cancer or any kind of chronic illness, they go into despair. But subhanAllah, for a believer, this is actually an intuition and subhanAllah, a welcome from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that there is a whole lot of entourage of angels who are waiting to welcome that believer with a red carpet treatment. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make our death blessed day for us such that the best of our deeds are the last of our deeds and may we all be resurrected with the best of our deeds inshallah so when we talk about death of course death is not a cessation of life it's the beginning of a new life so our motto of life is 
that we are able to furnish our house in Jannah. We're able to decorate our mansions of Jannah starting from dunya. So we start planting these fruits, just like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, whoever says, Subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar, a tree is planted for him in Jannah. I want all of us to say that. Perfect. Alhamdulillah. Congratulations. Inshallah, your tree is planted. The more we say, inshallah, the more we can have in our garden. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever says, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, a treasure is reserved for him in Jannah. I want all of us to say that. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever says, Allahumma salli wa sallim ala nabiyyina Muhammad, 10 of his sins are forgiven. He's given 10 good deeds and he is elevated 10 ranks in Jannah. We're talking about levels in Jannah, sisters. This is not simple. One level higher in Jannah means the world to us. So I want all of us to say that. Allahumma salli wa sallim ala nabiyyina Muhammad. Alhamdulillah. So as believers, we have to start preparing for our next home and start adorning it starting from this world. So as we conclude Surah Fajr, we come to the next Surah, which is Surah Balad. And Surah Balad is basically Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taking an oath to say that this city, the city of Mecca, has all right to have its own prophet. No one can expel him from the blessed city of Mecca. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam deserves to stay here. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam deserves to invite people to Islam. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has all the right to, um, subhanAllah, completely eliminate idol worship from the face of the world. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath with that. And then he emphasizes on the fact that man is indeed in turmoil, meaning each one of us are being tested. This world is a test for us. So say, for instance, someone slanders us, someone accuses us, someone oppresses us, someone harms us. We think to ourselves, why life is so unfair? Why me? Why do I have to go through these trials and tribulations? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us that for the believers, these are actually mode of purification process for us. If we are patient over these trials, it's a win-win for us. But if we complain and we nag and we backbite and we badmouth other people, then we're basically letting go of that reward that was literally coming to us. So for believers, this life is a test and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this test easy for us because accountability is haq and we will be questioned on the day of Qiyamah based upon our sins. So next we move on to Surah Shams and again Surah Shams is named after the sun where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, when we talk about the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are two types of ayat. There are shari ayat and there are manwi ayat. Shari ayat are the Quran, the ahadith, the literature that has been given to us by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in terms of his words or actions. This is shari ayat. But manwi ayat are those that are around us all the time. So whether the sun, the moon, the trees, the wind, the planets, the universe, the galaxy, these are ayat that are around us and they speak louder than words that my creator is one creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath of his creation in order to mention to us that verily accountability is near and we should prepare for it. Whoever denies it, is going to meet the fate of Ad and Thamud, who were destroyed um, in the past. Next, we move on to Surat Lay. And again, it has the similar um, theme as the previous Surah, Surat Shams, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about the two ways of life. Because just like sunshine is required for us, moonlight is also required, right? We cannot have shams all the time. We're going to get tired. 
we're going to want to go to sleep. We're going to want to have some peace of mind because we're exhausted. You know, ask the volunteers of the masjid who are present over here how badly they needed sleep last night, subhanAllah. So this is how it is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses us with the day and night and both of them are required. So the very next surah after Shams is the one where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath by the night and the day in order to mention to us that he is the one who has created the male and the female. He is the one who has created these sounds around, signs around us so that we can pay heed and purify ourselves. And the person who actually manifested in the best way possible the tazkiyah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam following the guidelines of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who is addressed over here is Abu Bakr radiallahu an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala applauds him in this surah by mentioning that he truly did tazkiyah of himself. So if any one of us want to embody the personality traits or the character traits of someone who is not a prophet, who is not an angel, then we should study the biography of the Sahaba. We should study the biography of Ummahatul Mu'mini. Because many a times when we come across the list of good and evil, we say to ourselves, ah, she, you know, he was a prophet. Of course, it was easy for him. He can definitely do this. You know, that was an angel. Of course, they can glorify Allah 24-7. We cannot. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions these examples to us that there are people who became the pioneers of deen despite the fact that they were not prophets, despite the fact that the wahi wasn't given to them. So if we want to have that kind of success, then we need to follow the legacy of these people because verily we come to know that Abu Bakr radiallahu an, just like he was the first one to believe in the message of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Mecca, he is going to be the first one to enter Jannah on the day of Qiyamah when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam enters Jannah. So if we wish to have that kind of companionship with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say to us? Al-mar'u ma'aman ahab. Because many a times we say to ourselves, okay, Abu Bakr radiallahu an was Abu Bakr because he met the Prophet. He stayed in the company of the Prophet all the time. What about me? Who are me? Measly me. I cannot really accomplish that much because I am after 1400 years and I haven't met the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So subhanAllah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has made this question very easy for us by answering our query by saying to us, Al-mar'u ma'aman ahab. Any person who loves the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is going to be in his company in Jannah. Imagine um, going into Jannah and living in the neighborhood of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Would any one of us wouldn't wish to have that? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us about role models that came as part of the legacy of Islam, whom we should embody and whom we should portray. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide all of us and keep us steadfast on deen. Next, we move on to Surah Duha. And this Surah, Surah Duha, was basically a Surah that brought hope and consolation to the heart of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a time when he was... SubhanAllah, abandoned at a time when he was in grief, at a time when he felt everyone has left him. SubhanAllah, this was the time when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comforted him by saying, your Lord did not abandon you, nor did he forget. And just to give you a quick, some context behind the surah, what happened was that when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam received the first wahi, there was a time lapse between the first wahi and the second wahi. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was so fearful that what went wrong? Did I mess up? Did I do something because of which I'm not receiving another wahi? Because of which I'm not having a communication with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What went wrong? And that's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the surah in order to comfort his heart. This was the same attitude of the sahaba as well. When the sahaba were not tested in dunya, 
they would get worried. Honestly, they would get worried that, oh my God, I didn't get a fever in this past month. I didn't go through loss of wealth. In this entire month, nobody oppressed me. Nobody badmouthed me. What happened? Did I mess up? Did I do something wrong? Why am I not tested? Perhaps I have lost this connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Perhaps my level of iman has weakened. So I need to increase my tawbah. I need to increase my salawat. I need to increase my tahajjud. That was the level of sahaba. So anytime we recite Surah Duha, let's not just think that, okay, this Surah was just to comfort the heart of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's also to comfort our hearts. When we think that we do not have anyone with us, when we feel that we are abandoned by everyone, and there are times when we do feel that, that there is no one in the world who actually cares for us, and I'm oppressed, and subhanAllah, people go through these kinds of phases, let us find comfort and solace in the surah, surah Duha. So moving on to the next surah, surah Sharh. And surah Sharh is basically a uh, twin surah to um, surah Duha because in this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has expanded the chest of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and lifted the burden away from him. So meaning the response of the dua of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa came, the wahi was given to him, the comfort that he was looking for was given to him. So basically both these surahs are attached to each other. So in this surah, the classic ayah comes where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna ma'al usri yusra, that with every difficulty, there is ease. So anytime we are faced with a tribulation, we are faced with a trial, it's not just a closed door that we see. Behind that closed door is a world of opportunities in that room that are concealed right now. Once that door is open and we enter in that realm, we're going to see the amount of khair that was hidden for us with the izan of Allah that he knew, but I didn't know. And subhanAllah, if we are to take a sneak peek onto our lives, we all, I'm sure, can come up with the multiple instances where we felt, oh my God, why did my parents send me to the school? You know, I don't want to go here. Later, we found out, oh my God, it was actually for my good. When we get married, we say, why am I getting married to this person? I don't want to get married to him. But subhanAllah, when we get married, we see the khair that comes as a result of this marriage. And then we realize, alhamdulillah, it was so much khair for me. There was so much khair for the entire family, right? SubhanAllah, so there are instances, there are situations where we're not able to find the wisdom behind the situation. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of his names is Al-Hakim. He knows what's khair for us. So many a times it's possible that we go through a very catastrophic marriage, an abusive husband or an abusive wife or children who are disobedient. There's marital discord amongst the family members. And it's like nasty for years and years. Again, many a time we're not able to see the hide behind it. But I swear to God, the patience that we learn in those few years when we go through those trials and tribulations, the way we connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and make dua to him, calling out the name of Salah, the calling out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the night and the day, begging to him, pleading him for his mercy. Do we do it when we are going through phases of happiness? Is our salah that prolonged when we are in prosperity and success? I don't think so because we become lax. So everything has a purpose to it. And the beauty of this ayah is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't say that after difficulty comes ease. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, with the difficulty is ease. So the ease is right there next to it. We're the ones who have closed our eyes and we're not able to see it. So subhanAllah, it's our deficiency, not the subhanAllah deficiency of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in any way, shape or form. So let's be content with the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Next, we move on to Surah Thin. And this is a surah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath by the fig. 
And any time when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath, whether it's by the fig, it's by um, time, whether it's by um, subhanAllah, Fajr, the 10 days um, of Dhul Hijjah, whatever it is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically wants to highlight the benefit of it. So for those of us who do not eat figs or we're not really fan of figs, subhanAllah, I'm not a fan of fig. Just subhanAllah, considering the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken an oath, we should eat it because there are so many health benefits in it, subhanAllah. So in this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath by figs and olives and subhanAllah, in order to emphasize that the conclusion is near, the day of piyama is near, so we should prepare for it. And subhanAllah, the crisis that is going on right now, the crisis of Gaza, the solar eclipse that's coming up, the people that are being tormented and oppressed, it has a message to tell us because there are things that are being unfolded every single day, which tells us that there is a plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's about to come. So again, subhanAllah, taking you all to a tangent, um, subhanAllah, one of the prophecies amongst the Jews is that near the end of times, they're going to find a unblemished cow, a red cow in heifer, which is going to be a certain age, three to four years old, and it's going to be completely unblemished. And once they find that cow, that's when they're going to build the Temple of Solomon. They are going to sacrifice that cow. They are going to burn the cow and use the ashes to purify themselves. And once they construct the Temple of Solomon, the Jal is going to come. And subhanAllah, after 2,000 years of finding, struggling to find this cow, they finally found it in Texas. <laughs> they have paid $500,000 for it to be transferred from Texas to the land of Israel. So they are going to do that, which means what? Which means that the times of Dajjal are very near, subhanAllah. And whether we accept it or not, the time that we live in are actually the end of times. And the Prophet wasallam mentioned to us in a hadith, that once the major signs of the day of Qiyamah start to come, it's going to be a necklace whose pearls are falling one by one when it's broken. That's how quickly they're going to come. So we really need to prepare ourselves because the only way how we can prepare ourselves against the Jal, the Prophet said, recite Surah Al-Kahf, meaning get attached to the Quran. Strengthen our iman with the Quran. And we may think to ourselves, okay, fine, I'm in my late 30s, so I'm soon going to die. I don't really have to worry about it. What about our children? Are they really strong to face the job? I don't think so, sister. SubhanAllah, even we are not that strong. Our generation is getting weaker and weaker in terms of their iman. SubhanAllah. So there's definitely a lesson for us to see because when we look at the oppressed Palestinians, it's mind blowing, subhanAllah. Yesterday I was uh, watching this video of a family, subhanAllah, they have barely anything to eat. And subhanAllah, they're still fasting. They're using grass to do suhoor and they have some cottage cheese with which they break their fast. So definitely these are people who have a lot of iman. And when we look at them, subhanAllah, we are nowhere even close, close to them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for them. So in this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us about the accountability to let us know that accountability is very near. So if we had been ignorant of the Quran for all these past years, I would say this is the time when we should actually rejuvenate our iman. 
this is the time that has come upon us and you can go on YouTube, you can find various videos on this red heifer topic and you're going to see how many scholars are talking about it, how many people are claiming that the day of Qiyamah is near because according to the Jews, the day of Qiyamah is near. The Christians are saying that once the Dajjal comes, it's going to expedite the coming of Isa alayhi salam. So Isa alayhi salam is coming and they believe that the Day of Judgment is near. And our Muslim scholars are saying that we know for sure the second coming of Isa. We know for sure that he is going to be able to completely finish off the Dajjal. So both of these signs are haq. They are true. They are going to happen. And we are living very close to those times. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us so that we're able to go through this trial, inshallah, in the best of ways, in a way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with us, inshallah. So moving on to the next surah, Surat Alaq. And subhanAllah, Surat Alaq is the most beautiful surah with which the entire story started. The story of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam becoming a prophet. The entire story started of Risala. The entire story started for us to have Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as our role model. So the surah starts off with Iqra, Bismi Rabbika Ladi Khalaq. Read in the name of your Lord who created. So over here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is basically sketching the scene for us when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was in the cave of Hira in order to worship Allah, contemplating the crisis that was going on at that time which was literally idol worship and making dua to Allah. That's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Jibreel alayhi salam and he had his first encounter with the Jibreel alayhi salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave knowledge to him. Iqra literally means read. So if we want to ascend higher levels in Jannah, what do we need to do? We need to acquaint ourselves with knowledge. We need to acquire knowledge. And it shouldn't be just book knowledge. It has to be knowledge that takes us towards action. It has to be knowledge which is implemented in our amal. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this surah to us to highlight the importance of knowledge. And subhanAllah, when it comes to knowledge, of course, there's secular knowledge and there is religious knowledge. And both of them are very much required for us in order to excel in the facets of life and in the facets of hereafter. So let's not undermine this knowledge and let's not think that in the 21st century, all we need is the secular knowledge and religious knowledge isn't important. Or let's not say, no, we're just going to be hukfaz and ulama. Secular knowledge is not required. Both of them are essential so that we can work our way higher in Iman. There's a true story I'm going to mention to you about a person who isn't a prophet, who isn't a Sahabi, but he lived at the times of the Salaf al-Salihin in the olden times. SubhanAllah, a narration comes about him, I'm forgetting the name, that SubhanAllah, when he passed away and the person who was the grave digger, he was about to bury his dead body in the grave. He saw that the grave was filled with the flowers inside. And he was so curious because it never happened to him that he had dug a grave and it was filled with greenery and flowers. SubhanAllah, he was very curious. He buried him and he carried out with his life. Few months later, another janaza came to him. Same thing happened when he dug the grave and he was about to bury the body and put it inside, the grave was filled with flowers. And this time he was actually very curious that I need to know who this person is and what's going on. So when he interrogates the matter, he comes to know both the men who died were sons of the same woman. SubhanAllah. So the person goes to the mother and says, what's your story? What happened to your sons? Because this is what I witnessed when I dug their grave. And the person said, this woman said, my first son was keen on seeking knowledge. He was always busy acquiring the knowledge of Quran. So perhaps because of his quest of knowledge, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewarded him this. 
the second son, he was busy going out and earning money to provide for his brother who was seeking knowledge. So subhanAllah, perhaps this was the reward that Allah gave to him as well. And subhanAllah, both of them has the same ajr. So many a times we think to ourselves, oh, I don't have book knowledge. I don't have Quranic knowledge. I'm not smart enough. Let us not despair. Let us invest in causes that can bring the same ajr to us, whether it's funding our masajids, whether it's sponsoring orphans, whether it's paying the tuition of hufaz, let's do something that can become a sadaqa jariya for us. And along with that, whatever knowledge we can acquire, how much time we can spend to acquire the knowledge of Quran, we should definitely do that. Because whatever amal we die upon, that's how we're going to be resurrected. And we want to be invited to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a state that is our best state. We want to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a state where we are purified. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the importance of knowledge to us. And of course, we already discussed that both these knowledges are important, secular and religious. And I just uh, constructed, I just created a um, chart for us to read. So next we move on to Surah Qadr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna anzalnahu fi laylatil qadr. We sent it down on the night of decree. But what will convey to you what the night of decree is? The night of decree is better than a thousand months. In it descend the angels and the spirit by the permission of their Lord with every command. Peace it is. Salamun. Until the rise of dawn. So when we think about laylatul qadr, let's remember that laylatul qadr can be any night in the last 10 nights of Ramadan. So once the 27th night is over, don't think Ramadan is over, by the way. It's still there. We can still benefit from the fruits of Laylatul Qadr. We can still seek Laylatul Qadr. So let's prioritize our time and do worship as much as possible. There's a beautiful narration of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where we come to know that there was a Sahabi who saw a dream, SubhanAllah. And in his dream, there were two people who were standing at the door of Jannah. And he sees that one person died as a martyr, one person died one year later. And when the announcement was made for people to enter Jannah, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala called in the person who died one year later, not from martyrdom, but with a natural death. And the Sahabi said, I woke up and I was surprised that how is it possible that subhanAllah, a person is martyr, yeah, the other person gets to go into Jannah first. How is that so? And the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam would sit with his Sahaba after Salatul Fajr in order to interpret their dreams. And the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam said to him, Ya Aba Talha, did he not remain behind with you for one more year? He said, yes. He said, did he not witness another month of Ramadan? He said, yes. He said, did he not pray with such and such number of sujood and prostrations? He said, yes. The Prophet wasallam said, so the difference between them is greater than what is between the heavens and the earth. SubhanAllah. So if we have opportunity to live one more year, Alhamdulillah. If we have opportunity to do one more sajda, alhamdulillah, it's worth the heavens and the earth. It's worth the heavens and the earth. If we have the opportunity to give one dollar in sadaqah, let's do so. If we have the opportunity to initiate salam and welcome a sister or brother who's feeling sad, depressed, let's not think, why should I waste my Laylatul Qadr for them? Let me just go and do more salawat. No, even that is a right of a brother. The Prophet said in one of the ahadith that, you know, removing an affliction from my brother is more beloved to me than staying in a state of ihtika for 10 days. So this is the reward of taking care of humanity. This is the reward for serving people. So let's not undermine any of these good deeds and try our best to do them as much as possible because this is the night which is giving us thousand months of reward. And subhanAllah, when we look at the nations of Nuh alayhi salam and the generation that lived back then, they used to live thousand years. 
subhanallah they literally lived for a thousand years they had such a long life now we think to ourselves that oh my god the you know the lifespan of this ummah is just 60 years as the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said so it's a very short life yet if we really want to make the most out of that life out of that 60 years what do we need to do convert that one night into 82 years of worship can we do that inshallah we definitely can all we need to do is try 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 struggle 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 and inshallah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward us with that the last portion of the surah and i really want to spend some time with the surah because we are witnessing uh the last 10 nights so inshallah i want to spend this time subhanallah um, when we look at the concluding part of the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us that there are so many malaika who descend upon the earth during this night that the place on earth actually becomes constricted because of the amount of malaika present on earth at that time. And amongst them is Ruh al Amin Jibreel alayhi salam. Imagine yourself worshiping in your room, praying salah, and right next to you is Jibreel alayhi salam making dua for you. Why do I say that, even though we're not prophets? Because there's literally a narration of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There he said, when a believer engages in salah, there are angels the size of mountains who are making dua for him. Subhanallah, and this is a prophetic hadith. If angels can be there with us all year round, imagine having Jibreel alayhi salam next to you, just like how he was with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Imagine him being making dua for you, how he used to make dua for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's an honor. That's an honor. That's a privilege that we all should make use of. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant all of us Laylatul Qadr. Allahumma balighna Laylatul Qadr. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept the ibadah that we have done so far. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us multiple Ramadans with multiple Laylatul Qadrs that are accepted, inshallah. So next we move on to Surah Bayyina. And according to some scholars, this is a Madani Surah. This Surah tells us that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came with a clear message. Also, in the concluding part of the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us the different state of people, the different fate of people, the ones who go towards righteousness and the ones who choose the evil fate. The ones who choose the evil fate, they are doomed. Whereas the ones who make the right decision and they choose the path of righteousness, then they are going to be amongst radiallahu anhum wa radu an. Again, I want you to imagine this title. Who do we attach it with? With the Sahaba, radiallahu an, right? Imagine if that title can be given to you. Because literally Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, for those people who do ita of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and follow the Quran, they can be amongst radiallahu anhum wa radu an. So this surah highlights that as the concluding ayah of this surah, which is a glad tidings for you and me, that if I want to have this title next to my name, just like we want to have the doctor title next to our name, this is something we really want to have in the hereafter amongst the inhabitants of Jannah. We definitely want to have the title of radiallahu an wa radu an. Allahumma ja'alna minhum. Next, we move on to Surat Zalzala. And of course, Surat Zalzala, just like the name says, it's talking about the Zalzala of the day of Qiyamah. And the eloquence of Quran is that whenever there is a repetition of letters, it means something going on back and forth. So Zalzala comes from Zailam Zailam. It has four root letters. So just like you can see the repetition of Zailam Zailam, that is how the zalzala of the day of judgment is going to be. It's not just going to be an earthquake that the media and news cover, you know, is going to cover and it's going to be viral on social media and it's going to be over after a few days. We're going to forget about it. No, it's going to be happening over and over again until the entire universe collapses. The stars fall down. The water turns into fire and that will be the day of Hashem. 
so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that on that day, the people <clears throat> will emerge in droves to be shown their works. Meaning all of us, we're going to come out of our graves and we're going to rush to our Lord so that we can face our accountability. Subhanallah, when we appear for an exam, and I have some people here who give exams multiple times, subhanAllah, students, youngsters, when we give an exam, it's never like a top surety that, okay, we have done excellent job and definitely we are going to get admitted to such and such university because we did best. It's definitely never, ever like that. We always have this feeling, oh, I could have improved this one thing. I could have answered this question a little better. I wish I did this a little more correctly. There's always this guilt. Imagine rushing to the day of Qiyamah, on the day of Qiyamah, rushing to our Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and having this notion in our heart, whether my deeds are accepted or not. It's not just a question. It's not just a quiz. It's a whole life that's on stake, that we do not know whether our deeds, our hasanat are accepted or not. So that zalzala that is going to uh, occur on the day of Qiyamah is not just going to be a mode of physical torment for people that as they're running, 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 the earth keeps collapsing in front of their eyes. It's also going to be this psychological fear in our heart that, oh my God, I don't know what's my result going to be. I don't know if I passed or failed. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala literally highlights that whoever has done an Adam's weight of good are going to see it. And whoever did an Adam's weight of evil are going to see it. How big is an Adam, by the way? Our doctors should say that to us or our students. It's very tiny. We cannot see it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-adl. He's al-alim. He's going to even reward us for an atom of good. And we're going to be held accountable for even an atom of evil. That's how the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. It's that serious. It carries a lot of gravity to it, yet we take it so granted. Subhanallah, we do not take it seriously. So next we move on to Surah Adiyat. And over here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes oath by Adiyat. What are they? They are the mighty horses that are used for war. So basically, those horses, they undergo through rough, uh, you know, strenuous training by their masters. So that when they are starved and they're made to thrive and when they're left thirsty, then in the time of war, they're able to actually perform exemplary. They're able to have this heightened energy and passion to fight the opponent. So those are adiyat. And why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take an oath with that? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, just like those horses are so obedient to their masters and they struggle and they starve, that's how insan should be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who blesses insan with so many blessings. And subhanAllah, it's literally a mercy, a blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he blesses us with Ramadan. Honestly, otherwise, no matter how many diet plans we go through, we always go through those cheat days and we always, you know, go on eating or drinking something that we're not supposed to. It's only Ramadan actually that keeps us on check, subhanAllah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us that this honesty of yours, this struggle of yours, it's going to be highly rewarded. Even if it was an atom weight worth of it, it will definitely be rewarded. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us that to be able to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of Qiyamah. So next comes Surah Qari'ah. And Qari'ah, just like the name says, it is a shocker. Why is it called Al-Qari'ah? Because when it happens, everyone is going to be in a state of shock. Everyone is going to be in a state of trauma. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights the scenes of the day of Qiyamah for us to mention to us about Mizan. That on that day, there are going to be scales weighing um, the deeds of people. And that's when the decision will be made, accountability will be done, and people will go to their relative homes. 
Now, when we think about Nizan, we only think about our deeds, our Amal. But it's not just the deeds that are going to be placed on our Mizan. The prophetic hadith mentions to us, even the book itself, the book of deeds, will be placed on Mizan. And then we as a person will also be placed on that scale, on that Mizan. And then all together, the judgment is going to be made to see which one outweighs the other. And... When we think about it, we're like, yeah, then it's going to be a lot of good deeds. Alhamdulillah, because I'm already overweight, so it's going to be good. <laughs> but subhanAllah, it's not like that on the day of Qiyamah, because our weight on the weighing scale is going to be based upon our amal. So if we actually did good, then inshallah, it's going to be heavy on our scales. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make our hasanat be heavy on that day, on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. So next comes Surah Takasur. Over here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us about the kathra of wealth. So over here, this surah talks about basically the evil consequences of materialism and subhanAllah running after this dunya. That when we're given immense wealth and money, that's when we kind of deviate from the path of Islam. That's when we kind of become lax in terms of our ibadah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us literally in this surah that let us be more cognizant towards the people who are around us. If we are blessed with wealth, let us take care of those people who are deprived, who are less fortunate than us. Because when we do that, then that can be a source of our forgiveness on the day of Qiyamah, inshallah. Next, we move on to Surat Asr, and Surat Asr literally is an oath that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes with time. So time is something very essential, and it's departing from us with every single day as we live. So there were people around us, with us, last Ramadan, who are not part of our lives anymore because their time ended, their clock stopped, their book of deeds was closed forever. But we have time, alhamdulillah. And when we have time, it's actually a blessing for us. Because every second that a clock is ticking, the angels are documenting our deeds. So we need to see what are we filling our book of deeds with. Are we filling it up with hasanat? Or are we filling it up with khiba, accusations, slander, namima, all that stuff? And the more goodness we fill our books with, it's going to shine on the day of Qiyamah. And just like we said in Jews number 29, for those people who are going to receive their book of deeds in their right hands, they're going to go to people and say, ha umuqra'u kitabiyah. Look at my book. It's so radiant. It's so shiny. You know, go ahead, post, tweet, share it with everyone. Because this is my book. I want everyone to read it. Imagine your state of happiness that day. And we all definitely want to be in that state where we want to share and publish our book of deeds that we are being authoring right now, that we're documenting right now. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make that book shine on the day of Qiyamah. So the very next surah, Surah Humaza, actually warns us against the misconduct that we often do against people who are around us. So whether it's backbiting, whether it's namima, whether it's tail telling, all these actions are actually actions that oppress others, that harms others. And we will be questioned for that harm. SubhanAllah, many a times the very um, victim of that oppression of our tongue are Unfortunately, our husband, our children, our parents, our in-laws, the immediate family members. And we don't really realize it, how much harm we're causing to them because we just think, oh, it's just a word. It's just a statement. It's okay. Everyone does that. All wives do that. What's the big deal in it? It is a big deal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala literally says, humaza. Woe to every slanderer and backbiter. So it's a stern warning for all of us, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us for our shortcomings and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala correct us because now is the time to actually mend our relationships. If we have harmed someone, whether it's our parent, whether it's our in-laws, whether it's our children, spouse, now is the time to say sorry, kill our ego, 
compromise on whatever issues we have and apologize. SubhanAllah, it's not that difficult. Yes, it's difficult for Iblis. That's why he didn't apologize to Allah since then. But we can do it. Because if we do it, guess what? When we're on the day of Qiyamah and we're standing on the bridge of Qantara, we don't have to give our good deeds to anyone, by the way. SubhanAllah. So let's think of it in this terms. If we really want to give away our good deeds to all the other people, and subhanAllah, enter Jannah with zero amount of good deeds or, you know, be on a base level of Jannah, then that's not something we want. Because when we backbite people, when we badmouth others, whether it's our family members or others, we literally are harming them. Do we want to give away all our good deeds just like that on the day of Qiyamah when we need them most? Of course not. So the ball is in our court and we need to decide. So the next surah we have is Surah Tfil. And of course, this surah reminds us about the event when the Kaaba was attacked by an army of Abraha. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed the army altogether. So the power, ultimate power is in the hands of Allah. And again, subhanAllah, looking at the crisis that's going on right now, yes, we feel that we lack in terms of resources. Yes, we feel our iman is not that solid. Yes, we feel we do not have that cavalry. We do not have those resources. Yet, if we have iman in our hearts, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can use his soldiers to destroy the opponent. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can use his authority to liberate the oppressed. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help the oppressed and free the Palestinians. Surah Quraysh, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this surah reminds the people of Mecca that it is indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who gave honor and prestige amongst the other tribes due to his house. And why is it called Surah Quraysh? Because Quraysh was literally a tribe in Mecca, the tribe that even the Prophet belonged to, who were amongst the elite and the influential. So they would consider themselves you know, very worthy of that title. They used to consider themselves as, subhanAllah, better than all others. So Allah subhanahu wa says in the surah that whatever accomplishments they had, whatever honor, dignity they got is because of Allah. Because Allah chose them to be the caretakers of Kaaba. Allah chose them for this noble task. So they shouldn't feel proud of it. They should rather thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because indeed it is his mercy. So again, it's a lesson for all of us that we should always stay humble. Surat Ma'un, again, reminds us about taking care of the creation because many a times we are excellent in terms of our ibadah. We're excellent in terms of finishing Quran after Quran in the month of Ramadan. But where we lack is serving humanity. Where we lack is taking care of the rights of others, subhanAllah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us about the rights of the poor and needy, that we should take care of them, we should remember them, and we should do every measure, whatever we can to help them out so that their poverty can be um, relieved from them. Next, we go on to Surat Kawthar, and Surat Kawthar basically is a bashara given to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, uh, SubhanAllah, blesses him with the glad tiding of having a river in Jannah by the name of Kawthar. And SubhanAllah, this is going to be the river where the believers are going to come and drink from by the hands of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and their thirst will be quenched forever. The Prophet ﷺ says that this river is whiter than milk and sweeter than honey. Imagine drinking from that river with the very hands of the Prophet ﷺ. What an honor. What an honor, subhanAllah. So if we want to receive that honor, inshallah, let's take a blessing from this Qur'an because indeed this Qur'an was the biggest miracle and gift given to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So if we wish to receive Al-Kawthar in Jannah, then let's take use, make use of this blessing, which is with us, the Qur'an. Surat Kafirun, subhanAllah, is named after Kafirun, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala literally um, invites the disbeliever to Islam by saying that there cannot be any compromise in the matters of faith and worship. Because many a times the people of Mecca would come to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam asking to make some kind of adjustments. That, okay, you worship our gods one day, 
we're going to worship Allah for the rest of the 365 days, 364 days. We're going to do it. Is it fair enough? Is it okay? Can you do that? And of course, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned to them clear cut that this is not possible, not for a day, not for a minute or a second. Meaning in our deen, in our faith, there is no compromise. So we cannot think to ourselves that, okay, if my father or grandfather was a hafiz of Quran, it's okay. I think I'm going to get a free pass in Jannah. Allah is going to tell me, go, because your father was a hafiz of Quran. He was a renowned scholar of Medina, so you are forgiven. No, it doesn't work like that. Our ibadat are not forgiven. We cannot compromise on our ibadat based upon the credits of other people. They are going to be held accountable for their deeds, and we will be held accountable for what we do. So we need to really value the opportunities that we have and make use of them. So next we have Surah Nasr, and Surah Nasr, it's mentioned, was one of the last surahs that was given to the Prophet Sallallahu in his life, where he was given the Bashara of the conquest of Mecca. So as this Bashara was given to him, this glad tiding was given to him, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala says to him, celebrate the praise of your Lord and seek forgiveness. Meaning when we are in the peak of happiness, whether it's graduation, whether it's getting married, whether it's having a child, whether it's seeing your children get married, whatever it is, when we are in the times of peak of happiness, what should we do? We should remember our Lord and seek forgiveness. But technically what we do end up doing, we miss our prayer because we're preparing for the party. We miss our zikr, morning and evening askar because we have to make all the arrangements. We even compromise on the fasting of Ramadan because, oh my God, I have an exam ahead of me. I need to pass this exam. So how can I be fasting for so many hours? It's the complete opposite of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So subhanAllah, this manual has been given to us that a believer always live in a state of shukr and sabr. Next we have Surat uh, uh, Masad where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us about the enemy of Allah, Abu Lahab, who was literally an uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how he will be burned in Jahannam. And this surah is literally a miracle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because if Abu Lahab wanted to prove the Prophet ﷺ wrong, if he wanted to prove the Quran wrong, guess what? He could have accepted Islam exactly at that time and he would have said, what is the surah talking about? Me burning in fire? No, I, I am a Muslim. I accepted Islam. He could have done it. But this is the miracle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah knew he's not going to accept Islam. He is going to die as a mushrik. And that's why this, you know, this prediction about him was already given to us. Many a time when we think about decree, qadr, we always have this question in mind. When Allah already knew who is going to Jannah and Nar, why do I even have to work for it? Because... I'm just going to go to Jannah because I'm a Muslim, right? So I think I'm fine. Why do I have to pray Salah? Why do I have to go to the masjid? Why do I have to go do Bajit? The divine decree was written by Qalam because of the knowledge of Allah, because he's Al-Alim. We have been sent to this world to do Amal so that it can be a hujjah for us on the day of Qiyamah. So that we do not question on the day of Qiyamah, Oh my Rabb, how did you throw me in hellfire? What did I do? I was a poor, innocent Muslim. I didn't do anything wrong. No. In order to establish that hujjah for us, that's why we are sent in this world, even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already knows the future for all of us. So as we come to the conclusion of Quran, we have the three quls that um, are highlighted over here, Surah Ikhlas, which... Uh, basically affirms our faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no one worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the one and only. Next, we have Surah Falaq, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us about the evil that is lurching around us. SubhanAllah, that there are things that are harmful around us, whether it's sorcery, whether it's the darkness, whether it's the hasad of people. There is evil around us, but guess what? We need to take this evil positively and seek refuge in Allah through the Quran and by following the Sunnah of the Prophet.
So last but not the least, we have Surah Tunnas. And in this Surah, of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is honoring us, Annas, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning to us that shaitan is always on his agenda to mislead human beings. And he is the one who always puts this waswasa in our minds, in our hearts, so that we can basically deviate from Islam and die upon shirk. And this is part of reality. As we come to the conclusion of Quran, I want to highlight the last moments of a person's life. We come to know that when we are about to die, shaitan literally comes to us trying to mislead us from Islam so that if we can say one statement of shirk, we can end up in Jahannam. What's the proof? It happened with Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, when he was about to pass away. He was saying in his dream, not yet, not yet. And his son asked, oh my father, what happened? Is it the angel of death that you are seeing? And you're saying, no, not yet. I don't want to die yet. I don't want to die yet. And he said, no, rather, I saw shaitan biting on his fingernails, saying, oh, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, you slipped out of my hands. You slipped out of my hands. And I said to him, not yet, till I die. So as believers, this test continues on till the moment of gargara, when our soul is literally about to depart from our body. This struggle goes on till that time. So we can never be relaxed. We can never be confirmed that we are definitely going to succeed. We always need to keep putting in the efforts, keep trying our best. And inshallah, once we do that, then hopefully Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can welcome us by saying, Ya ayyatuha nafsu al-mutma'inna, irji'i ila rabbiki radiyatan mardiyya, fadkhuli fi ibadi, wadkhuli jannati. So these were the surahs that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would recite after every morning and evening against all kinds of hasad, all kinds of harms, all kinds of evils that is not apparent to us, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is knowledgeable of that and Allah wants to protect us from all that danger. So we should use it as our shield against all the harms so that we can see the bliss of this dunya and the hereafter. So with that said, alhamdulillah, we come to the conclusion of this Quran. And just like we always begin Quran and conclude Quran, the motto of life of a believer is that Quran never ends. So we are going to Subhanallah, we start our Quran with the Fatiha. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan ar-rajim. Bismillahi r-Rahman rahim Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Ar-Rahman rahim Maliki yawm al-deen. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'een. Ihdina sirat al-mustaqeem. Sirat al-lazina an'amta alayhim. Ghayri al-maghdubi alayhim. Wala al-dalleen. Ameen. In the name of Allah, most gracious and most merciful, all the praises and thanks be to Allah, the most gracious and the most merciful, the only owner of the day of judgment. You alone we worship and you alone we ask for help. Guide us to the straight path, the way of those on whom you have bestowed your grace, not of those whom you have whom, who earned your anger, nor of those who went astray. Amin ya Rab. With that said, we conclude our session for today. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashhadu wa la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adhab al-nar. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta sami'u al-alim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all the sisters who came here, participated, dedicated their time every single day, 60 minutes or plus or more, for your kalam, to study your, uh, your Quran, your kalam. Ya Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we ask you to accept this from us. Rabbana taqabbal minna, inna ka anta samiul alim. Ya Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we ask you to have mercy on us with the Quran. Allahumma rahamni bil Quran, waj'alhu li imama wa nooran wa hudan wa rahma. Allahumma anis wahshati fi qabri. Allahumma rahamni bil Quran al-azim, waj'alhu li imama wa nooran wa hudan wa rahma. Allahumma dhakkini minhuma nasit, wa'allimni minhuma jahilt. Warazuqini tilawatahu ana al-layli wa ana al-nahar. Waj'alhu li hujjatin ya rabbal alameen. 
O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we implore you with the best of your names. Allah, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Al-Malik, Al-Quddus, the best of your names that you have mentioned and those that you have kept secret with you. Ya Allah, we ask you to accept our humble deeds. Ya Allah, we ask you to accept the little minute efforts that we have put forth in your cause. Ya Allah, we ask you to forgive our sins. Oh Allah, you are the best of protectors and the best of those who give help. Ya Allah, glory be to you. We cannot praise you in a manner that is due for you. You are as you have praised yourself. Ya Allah, sublime is your countenance. Exalted is your position. You do as you will by your power and ability. Ya Allah, you decree as you want by your honor. Ya Allah, whatever you have decreed for us, enable us to be pleased with this decree. Ya Allah, accept our prayers. Accept our siyam, accept our qiyam, accept our salawat, accept our bowing, accept our bowing and our sujood. Ya Allah, divert our restlessness in the grave into peace. Ya Allah, let us receive your mercy by means of the noble Quran. Ya Allah, make it a guide for all of us as a source of light, guidance, and grace for us. Ya Allah, revive our memory of whatever we were made to forget from the noble Quran. Ya Allah, grant us understanding of whatever part we do not know. Ya Allah, enable us to recite during the hours of the day and night and make it an hujjah for us in all matters. Ya Allah. Allow the Qur'an to be our close companion in this life. Ya Allah, allow the, uh, the Qur'an to be a companion in our grave, a comforting friend and the light on Sirat. Ya Allah, allow the Qur'an to be a means of intercession for us and to be a companion for us in Jannah. Ya Allah, we ask you for, to make the Qur'an a guide and a leader for us in whatever we do. Ya Allah, you are the most generous one. Ya Allah, benefit us with this Qur'an. Elevate us through this Qur'an. Accept from us ever recitation and overlook our mistakes and our forgetfulness and our inattentiveness. Ya Allah, resurrect us, our Lord, with your beloved Prophet, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the chosen al-Mustafa, the one to whom you have granted the right of intercession. Mm -hmm. Ya Allah, we seek refuge in you from knowledge that does not benefit and from a heart that is not humbled in devotion to you. Ya Allah, from an eye that does not weep, out of love and all of you, Ya Allah, we seek refuge from ego that is never satisfied and from a supplication that is not answered. Ya Allah, we seek refuge in you from death and its agonies. Ya Allah, we seek refuge from adab al-qabr and its distress. Ya Allah, we seek refuge from the darkness on the path of sirat. And we seek refuge in you, Ya Allah, of the horrors of the day of judgment. Ya Allah, make us fearful and conscious of you as if we see you. Ya Allah, grant us happiness through reverence of you and grant us the pleasure of seeing you, Ya Allah. And gather us in the company of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ya Allah, bless my parents. SubhanAllah, nothing was possible without their help and support. Whatever I accomplish is due to their du'as. Ya Allah, forgive them, have mercy on them and elevate their status. Ya Allah, show us the ways to win your pleasure and do not let shaitan create a dissension between us. Ya Allah, cleanse our heart from hypocrisy and our actions from showing off and our tongue from falsehood and our eyes from cheating. Ya Allah, respond to our dua. Ya Allah, you are the healer of sick. Ya Allah, have mercy on all the people who are sick. Make it easy for them. Ya Allah, have mercy on our amat, on our dead, on our, on our deceased members of our family, our loved ones, our brothers, sisters, the ones who are dying right now in Gaza. Ya Allah, have mercy on all of them. Ya Allah, defeat our enemies. Ya Allah, do not appoint us in our hope. You, ya Allah, do not disappoint us in our hope in you. Ya Allah, let the last of our deeds be the best of them. Ya Allah, we seek refuge with you from your giving our record of deeds in our left hand or behind our back. Ya Allah, give our record of deeds in our right hand and take from us an easy reckoning. Ya Allah, make us amongst those who rely upon you for those who you consider successful and place, among, place us amongst those who are near to you, Ya Allah. 
Ya Allah, beautify us with the covering of chastity. Ya Allah, cover us with the clothes of contentment. Ya Allah, allow us to adhere to your commands with justice and fairness. And Ya Allah, keep us safe from all that we fear by your protection. Mm -hmm. Ya Allah, make us patient over the events that are decreed. Mm -hmm. Grant us the ability to be pious and be in the company of the righteous. Ya Allah, distance us from our mistakes as you have distanced the east and the west. Ya Allah, purge our sins from us the way a white cloth is purified from filth. Ya Allah, cleanse us from our sins with the purity of water, snow, and hail. As we exit the month of Ramadan, Ya Allah, may we exit in a state of heightened iman. May we exit the month of Ramadan in a state that you have forgiven us. Ya Allah, may we exit the month of Ramadan in a state that you have elevated us. Ya Allah, do not condemn us for our slips. Do not make us a target for afflictions and troubles. Ya Allah, grant us the obedience of having the humble expansion of our heart through repentance, through tawbah. Ya Allah, bless Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his family. Ya Allah, on the day when we see you, Ya Allah, when we meet you, Ya Allah, make it be the best day of our lives. Ya Allah, the day when we see our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for the first time. Ya Allah, he's not disappointed in us. Ya Allah, hopefully he's not disappointed in us. Ya Allah, on this day, multiply for us the blessings of this Quran, the blessings of Ramadan, the blessings of Laylatul Qadr. Ya Allah, ease our path towards his bounties. Ya Allah, do not deprive us of the acceptance of good deeds. Ya Allah, have mercy on the orphans. Feed the hungry. Ya Allah, spread peace amongst in the world. Ya Allah, keep us in a state that we are in a state of strengthening our iman. Let us taste the halawa of iman. Let us taste the sweetness of remembrance and grant us through your graciousness so that we can thank you, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, we ask you to ease the pain and suffering of the innocent Muslims in Gaza. Ya Allah, we ask you to ease the pain and suffering and liberate our Palestinian brothers and sisters and grant them victory. Ya Allah, ease the situation of all the oppressed people. Ya Allah, accept the prayers of all the sisters who are present here and those who are online and those who were not able to come. Ya Allah, cure the ones who are sick. Ya Allah, relieve the ones who are distraught. Ya Allah, you are the provider. Provide for everyone who are seeking out the risk. Ya Allah, bless all the people and their families who are working for your deen. Ya Allah, you are Al-Badood. You are the connector of hearts. Join the hearts of all the people who are undergoing a rift in their relationship. Whether it's between spouse or friends or family members, Ya Allah, unite them with your love and mercy. Ya Kareem, all those people who are seeking a spouse, Ya Allah, grant our children a righteous and loving companion who can be their soulmate in works of deen and dunya. Ya Allah, all those people who are supplicating for a child, bless them with a healthy, righteous offspring who can become a coolness of eyes for them. Ya Allah, guide our children. Ya Allah, guide our children who have deviated from the path of Allah, from the path of Islam. Ya Allah, guide them and bring them back to Islam. Ya Allah, keep our children steadfast on our deen. Keep all our generations live on Islam and die upon Iman. Ya Ar-Rahim, make us a sadaqi jariyah for our parents, for our teachers. Ya Allah, make our offspring a sadaqi jariyah for us and their offspring sadaqi jariyah for them. Ya Allah, you are al-hadi. Ya Allah, guide the ummah who is deviated. Unite all of us upon the teachings of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ya as-salam. Enable us to practice our deen in the best way possible despite the hatred of Islam around us. Ya Allah, you are a tawab. Grant us the forgiveness and make us, subhanAllah, grant us a life that pleases you, Ya Allah. Grant us a death that you are pleased with. Ya Allah, make this Quran a coolness of eyes for us. Ya Allah, make salah a peace of heart for us. Ya Allah, accept the invocations of all your abd, whatever is khair for us, and replace our du'as with whatever is khair for us, and make your decision pleasing to us, Ya Rabbul Alameen. Ya Allah, my heartfelt du'as for all my teachers, Ya Allah, I ask you to provide them with the best of best in this world and the hereafter. Ya Allah, we ask you to elevate the ranks of Hafiz Ayyub, one of my teachers, Ya Allah, make all of us 
sadaqa jariya for him ya allah forgive him elevate his status elevate his ranks in jannatul firdaus mm -hmm. ya allah we ask you to bless his family his wife his children ya allah with the best of this world and the hereafter mm -hmm. ya allah we ask you to put baraka in our blessed institution in our blessed masjid icm ya allah Give us an opportunity to serve this masjid. Ya Allah, give us an opportunity to fund this masjid. Ya Allah, give us an opportunity to expand this masjid so that multitudes of our generation and people to come can pray in it, become hafiz of Quran in it, and all of them can become a sadaq jariya for us. Ya Allah, all the people who are serving this masjid, our relentless volunteers who are working tirelessly behind the scenes ya allah whether it's sister anila sister asma zeba sister sadia sister parveen sister romana subhanallah the multiple names may allah forgive me for whoever i forgot ya allah we ask you to be pleased with them ya allah we ask you to bless them and their families ya allah whatever time effort energy youth they have dedicated their health they have sacrificed for your sake ya allah make it heavy upon mizan on their mizan on the day of qiyamah ya allah whoever amongst us is serving your deen in any way shape or form ya allah except the little that we do ya allah with the greatest of your mercy ya allah Allah, and forgive our sins and grant us nearness to you. Ya Allah, protect us from adab al-qabr. Ya Allah, grant us a blessed ending. Ya Allah, grant us kalima shahada when we die. Ya Allah. Ya Allah, we ask you to meet you in a state that you're pleased with us. Ya Allah, ease the horrors of the day of judgment. Ya Allah, enable us to meet you in a state that you're pleased with us. Ya Allah, enable us to meet you in a state that you're pleased with us. Ya Allah, we ask you to accept the supplications of all those people who are here. Ya Allah, we ask you to accept our humble efforts in the month of Ramadan. And we ask you to grant us a life and death in a state that you're pleased with us. Ameen, Ya Rab. Insha'Allah, we will conclude our session for today. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashhadu wa la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka, nastaghfiruka, nastaghfiruka. Wa natubu ilayk. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana. Wa fi al-akhirati hasana. Baqina adhaab al-nar. Allahumma salli wa sallam ala nabiya Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.